of God. Turn me to the New Testament, to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. We'll begin reading in verse 3. The Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth, or bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of of Christ. In verse 4, the Bible says, for, our, for the weapons of our warfare. So we're going to talk about, we find that little phrase, our warfare. I hope you understand we're in a war. We're in a war right now, and I'm not talking about the United States with somebody else, or Democrats with the Republicans, or poor with rich, or whatever. I'm talking about the spiritual battle that we as believers are in, really everybody's in, but we are able to fight on the right side of it as believers. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the truth we find here. Lord, although we're living in this flesh, we don't have to war and use the things of this flesh and try to win the battle in this flesh. Lord, you give us the victory, and we're thankful for that. Thankful for this truth here tonight as Paul was trying to get this across under the power of the Holy Spirit and inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the Corinthian believers um, in their life to find this victory against the things that have set up in their life that were hurting them spiritually and physically probably as well. And Father, we need, we need your help tonight. We need you to identify, to put your hand in our life, to show us strongholds in our life, things in our life that that are coming against us, that, that we need help with, that we can look to you and let you over be the overcomer in our life, that you are, and show yourself strong. And Lord, may all these things come into obedience to you. May we come in obedience to you, and therefore all these other things will come in obedience to you, and we can live the victorious Christian life, and we sure do want to. We want to honor and glorify you with our life. I pray you'd guide us in that tonight, our thoughts, our actions and reactions to your word tonight. I pray you'd make it clear for us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our warfare. There might be somebody here tonight that's not taking your stand in this battle. We're in it. But sometimes soldiers don't take their stand. Well, they ought to take their stand. There might be somebody here that is standing but not taking any new ground. You might be taking a stand. Yes, I'm a believer. Yes, I love the Lord. But that's where you're at, and you're standing, but that's all you're doing. You're not taking any new ground. And there might be somebody here that's standing, but needs to take back some ground that you lost. Because somewhere along the line, you stepped back from where you used to be at with the Lord, and now he needs to help you make some new ground up, because we're in a war and uh, usually wars don't go like this. We just stand in one place. Somebody's advancing. Somebody's retreating. There's always movement going on uh, in a war. And so we are in a war. The Bible says here, our warfare. So I want you to see some things about our warfare. First of all, we have a spiritual war that we have to battle. We have a spiritual war that we have to battle. Now, of course, we are in the battle but we're, it's not all relying upon us, okay? And so let's look back here at verse 4, and the Bible says, for the weapons. Now, this is a, a parenthetical statement, so there's a parentheses here around it, and uh, it's, it's sat in the middle of this statement that he's talking about. And he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Now, carnal means fleshly. If you call someone a carnal believer... That means they're living in the flesh, although they believe in Christ and they have Christ living in them. They're choosing to yield to the flesh and 
they're carnal. I mean, Paul called somebody out and wrote in Scripture, the Lord recorded it, that he said, you're, you're carnal. Are ye not carnal? He asked them, are you not living according to your flesh instead of living according to the power of the Spirit? Now, the battle that we're facing, the weapons are not carnal, so I'm not going to pick up a gun and shoot the devil. Right? I'm not going to pick, pick up a sword and swing it at the devil. I'm not going to box with the devil. I'm not going to beat him that way. Right? And I'm not, surely I'm not going to go against other people because the battle's really not against other people. I mean, we see it that way, right? <laughs> the person that's giving you a lot of problems, that's who you're battling. Your family members that are giving you a lot of problems, that's who you're battling. Your boss is who you're battling. If you're the boss, maybe your employees, <laughs> that's who you're battling. No, those are not the real battle. Those battles come because of the battle, the spiritual battle that everybody's in. That's the battle we're facing. And, and the Bible says here that our weapons are not carnal, but mighty. So that's telling us that the weapons that are carnal are not mighty. They're very weak. They're very weak. And it says, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And a stronghold is something that, that's got a hold of you in your life, and you can't have victory over it. You need God, you need the mighty God to help you pull a stronghold. A stronghold was when uh, something has victory over you. In the Bible, we read about battles and people getting a stronghold. Uh, and when they do that, the battle is almost certainly over because the victory is coming for the people who got the stronghold all over the other people. And so what we know is this is something that's defeating us in our life. And I believe that most we all have besetting sins that if not taken care of, they will become a stronghold in our life and they will defeat us over and over and over again if we are not walking in the might and the power of God and using that weapon in our warfare. And so we have this battle. And I want to tell you uh, some, some things that we're battling against. Our spiritual war is against the devil. That's pretty, pretty easy to identify. Um, now, I don't think... When I say that, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. But when I say that, I don't mean that you wake up in the middle of the night and the devil's standing in your room and you fight against him. That he's attacking you because the devil can only be at one place at one time. So that means he's not attacking all of us all week long. The devil himself, Satan, Lucifer. Right? He might be attacking somebody, but usually the captain doesn't do the attacking. Usually there's a hierarchy, and we know that. There's principalities and powers. We're going to read that in a second, Ephesians 6. He usually doesn't do the attacking, but he's got all of the demons doing the attacking, okay, in this spiritual battle, these fallen angels uh, that we see. And so with the devil. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. You know that phrase that most people like to use, the devil made me do it? Well, that's very unbiblical. <laughs> all right. They probably got that from Eve, right? Finally, verse 10 of Ephesians 6, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now, that doesn't say anything about you being strong in yourself. Come on, just try again. Just work it out again. Just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Just You can do better next time. That is not what Paul said to the Ephesians. Paul said, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Stand against, uh, stand against the wiles of the devil. That means his methods, his ways, the things that he's doing, the things he's crafting against us. We ought to be able to stand against those things. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's why our warfare is not carnal, because it's not against flesh and blood. The Bible says here, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is the spiritual battle that's being talked about here, and it's against the devil. You'll remember in Job that the devil specifically, now you've got to remember, there was a lot less people at that time. <laughs> and maybe the devil did come specifically against Job, or maybe he had the hierarchy that he had already set up, and when he went to God and asked him, can I do this to your servant Job? That he said yes, and then he told his hierarchy, you know, go take care of this and, take, and do this to Job. But the battle, the devil was coming after him because he was living right and he was living for God. 
And so he came after him. And so our spiritual war ultimately is against the devil uh, there. Now, the second thing that we need to see is our spiritual wars against the world. Now, the Bible says here, even in this passage of Scripture, the darkness of this world, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the Bible says that that's what we're battling against. And all of that hierarchy that we've already talked about is, is, is um, coordinated and set in motion by the devil uh, there. Now, also in 1 John, I want you to take a second to go over to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. Talking about our war is against the devil, but it's also against the world. Now, when we say against the world, we're not talking about this earth. We're not talking about the people on this earth. We're talking about the world system in which the devil is over, which he set up in order to tempt us, to entice us, to draw our lust out of us, and for us to give way to it so it can conceive in sin and bring forth death in our life. And that's the world system. Now, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, love not the world. That's the system that the devil is in control of. And uh, it says, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So, we get a clear idea that we cannot love the world and God. Not possible. Now, an hour from now, you can love the things of this world, but you're still not loving God at that point. Now, you can love God an hour from now, but then you're not loving the things of this world. You're not giving yourself to the things of this world uh, if you're giving yourself to God. And so the Bible says here that we're not to love the world. Well, we're warring against the world. You know, Noah had to deny the lust of the world to follow the Lord. I mean, there was a lot of wickedness. Um, it makes it sound like in the Bible there's more wickedness going on in Noah's day than in our day. I don't know how that is, but they said every man was given, given. Their hearts were deceitfully uh, deceitful, and they were given over to wickedness. And so he had to deny the world and what everybody else was doing because he loved God. And by the way, that, that paid off pretty good, didn't it? The Lord kept him through the flood. All right, and then our spiritual war is not only against the devil and the world, but it's against the flesh. It's against the flesh. And in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, so the next verse, it says, For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is, and, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So it's talking about the things that we have to deal with in our flesh. So the devil has a system, a hierarchy that he set up. He's running, he's the prince and power of the air, that means of this world, and he set up a world system that entices the lust of our flesh and the lust of our eyes and the pride of life to suck us in, to yield to that, to start to love that because our flesh loves those things. And we battle against that. So I don't personally, I'm pretty sure I've never battled the devil. I might have come and confronted somebody before that was possessed by a demon. That's very possible, I believe it was. But I still didn't confront the devil, right? Right? I have not taken on the complete world system, but, I, but the system that the devil's put in place, some of it wants to trap me in the lust of my flesh. But what I do deal with every day is that lust of the flesh. Just like you, in one of the areas, or all of the areas of the, of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we deal with those. And every sin comes out of those things that the world is lusting and uh, getting us, enticing us into, and we have to deal with. And Paul talked about that battle with his flesh. If you remember in Romans 17... I'm sorry, ch uh, chapter 7, verse 14 through 25, he talks about how he did the things he didn't want to do, and then he didn't do the things that he wanted to do, and he's going back and forth, and he's saying, it's because of the, my sin that dwelleth in me. It's the flesh, and there is no good thing in my flesh, Paul said. And he's dealing with the flesh daily, and that's very aggravating when we don't kill the flesh, not literally. Now, I'm telling you, go beat yourself and bleed yourself, right? I'm telling you, die to yourself and live to God. Let him have control because we're in a spiritual battle and the battle is won by doing the will of God and the will of God is not to love the world and the will of, the God, will of God is not to yield to the flesh and the temptations of it. But look at verse 17 of 1 John 2. It says, And the world passeth away. You know what that means? This whole system of enticement 
is one day it's going to be gone. All the promises that this world makes to us through the devil's influence is going to one day be gone. And I'm thankful for that. And it says, and the lust thereof. The world's going to pass. The lust's going to pass. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's where we do it. That's where we get the victory. Being in God's will for our life. And the key to this victory and the key to doing God's will to our not life is renewing the renewing of our minds. Because the Bible tells us back in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, after it just talked about us not living in the flesh and warring after the flesh, being carnal, but through God, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. All of those things that just talked about in, chapter, in verse 5, Deal with the mind. Deal with the things that come across our minds, into our brains, and we, we think about it, we process it a certain way, and we can process it and bring those things, anything that comes across our minds, we can have victory over that thing, and we can bring that into obedience to Christ, and that's where we find the victory. But our minds have to be renewed so we can think like Christ, so we can bring those things into obedience to Christ, because it's not in our power that we can do so. In, I want to remind you that in Romans chapter 12, we find this truth in verse 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, which that's the bad thing, right, that the devil's in control of, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The renewing of our mind. So we are in a spiritual battle. And we have to do battle. We're in a war, but we have to do battle within that war. And we have to nail that down. If you're going to go day to day and not realize you're in a battle, and the things that you deal with day to day, you don't realize these are spiritual things that are manifesting themselves in the physical, then you've already lost the battle. Because you're not even battling. You're just letting life go by, and you have no victory. You're just doing whatever, whatever the river of life takes you down. You're just floating down that river, and that's all that you're going to do. Well, secondly, we have spiritual weapons to use in this battle that we ought to use. In Ephesians chapter 6, that we were just at, um, talking about the devil and how he fights against us there, the wiles of the devil. The Bible begins in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 6, and it lays out here for us some, some armor that we have some things that we have available to us and that we can use. And they're, they're of God. They're not things that we get on our own or things that we come up with or they're not flesh or carnal. These are spiritual. And the Bible says in verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the devil, the, oh, I'm sorry, we withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Then verse 14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about, with truth. So first of all, we have the truth. This is part of the spiritual armor that we have, or the spiritual weapons that we have, is the truth uh, here. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. You might want to leave your finger here in Ephesians. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, of course this truth is talking about the Word of God, the Word of truth. And, and the Bible says in verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God, does a lot of things for us. It tells us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. That's what the Word of God is used for. That's what the Bible said. It's profitable for those things uh, there. And, uh, and we ought to use it for those things. But the truth. By knowing the truth, we can also know what is false. That's part, of, that's part of the problem in our life is we know truth or we don't know truth, one of those, or we don't let the truth be applied to our life so we don't know what's wrong and we don't have victory over it because we never say, Lord, I need help with this because we never admit that it's wrong in our life. Whatever that might be, that we're dealing with, with the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of life, 
that's enticing us. We never admit it's wrong if we have the truth of the word of God and have victory over it. Then the Bible says, and back in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 14, he says, not only are our loins going about with truth, it says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. So we have the breast, breastplate of righteousness. And this is our purity in yielding to the Lord. So we get the righteousness of God when we get saved, but there's also a practical righteousness that we have as we walk with God and a purity about us that God wants us to have. And that is the putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Then in verse 15, the Bible says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we have the gospel of peace. And I would imagine that's referring back to uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection that we know, that we receive, that we have now, and that we can give to someone else. And this is referring to our feet shod with the, gospel, the preparation of the gospel uh, of peace. That means where we go, we bring the gospel of peace. And that means that you can have peace with God through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But we can also have the peace of God through that death, burial, and resurrection as well. And we get the peace of God as we walk with Him, and we can only have peace with Him is through Him, having a relationship with Him. So we need peace, with, peace of God. When we come across people that don't know Him, they need to have peace with Him first. But this is the gospel of peace. Of what he's done for us. So we ought to, as we go, we ought to be taking it because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3 says this, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If the God, in whom the God of this world, and we know that's the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so we ought to be taking that and giving that gospel to a lost and dying world. Then, then the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. So we have the shield of faith, and this is when we truly exercise faith in the Lord. Um, we're, we're trusting Him as we go, and when we do so, the Bible says it's a shield of faith. Practically as we go. When you exercise faith, this is the idea. The devil's harmless. There is nothing he can do to you when you exercise faith. He is not stronger than God. His fiery darts that he's shooting, they will never be able to penetrate the shield of faith. And it's not really about what we do, but when we trust God, it's what he does for us and his protection he gives us. By the way, it's never about us, <laughs> but it's what we do with what he's given us. So are we going to yield to that? Are we going to let him use us uh, in our life? The shield of faith, we have it. We have the helmet of salvation, next thing, in verse 17. Sorry, in verse 16, let me finish it out. It says, wherewith, talking about the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I love that. It's not just some of them. It's not like he's going to shoot 100 at you today, and you're only going to be able to get 80 of them. Like your shield of faith, it will not withstand more than 80. No, it will take care of all of them. All of them. If you have faith. And... And by the way, it's not just you having faith, it's the object of your faith. It's Jesus Christ. A lot of people talk about faith, but they have faith in themselves, they have faith in somebody else, they have faith in blah, 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 but they don't trust Jesus. They don't believe He can do anything. It's something else that they're believing in. It's faith in the Lord. Then the Bible says in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. And so, I would think, and just an application here is uh, we fight best when we have assurance. Know that you're saved. Take that with you. Wear it. Show everybody, I got the helmet of salvation. Uh, it should be no secret. And we shouldn't be guessing about whether we have eternal life or not. The Bible says we can take the helmet of salvation here. And 1 John uh, chapter 5 and verse 13 says this, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We can know that we have eternal life. We can have assurance that we have salvation because eternal life, if we have been saved, we have eternal life, and you don't have eternal life if you haven't been saved. So this helmet of salvation is something that we have that we can wear and we can be assured of our salvation in the Lord. 
The Bible also says in verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Which is the Word of God. So we have the sword of the Spirit. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 4. Also referring to the Word of God. And the Bible says here, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God. See what it does to us? We need the Word of God to divide us. The thoughts and the intents of our hearts, sometimes we don't even know that. Probably a lot of times we don't know that. We know what our heart's thinking. We know what we're thinking and meditating on and what's in our minds and how we're processing things. We know if it's right or wrong. But the intents of it, the Word of God just cuts right through that and He tells you, no, no. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, I didn't even see that. But God just pointed that out in my life that that's wrong. Those are wonderful times, by the way. That's not a bad thing. That's not a, that's not a, um, uh, like a crying thing spiritually. Oh, God got on to me. No, those are good times because God cares enough about you through his word to reveal something to you and to show you who you really are and who he really wants you to be. And it's very helpful. And we can use the word of God. Yeah, we can use it as an offensive weapon. Uh, we can it's a sword, right? We can cut with it. We can use it to battle the devil with. Uh, we can use it as a defensive weapon. When we're attacked, it can also be defensive. Uh, but we have the Word of God. We ought to be using the Word of God. We have the sword of the Spirit. It's powerful. And then the Bible says in verse 18, most people stop in 17, but 18 continues the thought. And then it says this, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That means... If you're like, well, what does that mean? Is that some kind of spooky thing in the spirit? This is what it doesn't mean in the flesh. So don't, don't be praying in the flesh. Pray in the spirit, okay? Doing what God, praying about what God wants you yielded to him. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So he's saying pray. Pray in the Spirit. Persevere in the Spirit. Pray for other saints. Pray for me, he's saying. Pray for me. That's where we have help. The power of prayer. Power of prayer in your life for the needs you have. But you know what? Somebody else is counting on you to pray for them. And power there. He said, pray. If, if Paul didn't think, and if this wasn't true, God wouldn't have recorded it. Somebody else's prayers were going to help him speak boldly what he needed to speak. That's why I asked you to pray for me. That's why I asked you to pray for me on Wednesday. I mean, I need your prayers. Power of prayer. Now, in application about these spiritual weapons, we just looked through them very briefly here. But when we have the assurance that we are saved, then we have confidence in serving the Lord. That's the helmet of salvation. When we put the word of God in our heart, we can, in return, use it to witness to the lost and use it against the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the truth that we have. That's the gospel of peace and the sword of the Spirit. When we spend time with the Lord in prayer, then he cleanses us with his blood and helps us to be pure in our everyday life. What do we see there? It's the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and the power of prayer. We have spiritual weapons to use in this battle. So if we realize we're in spiritual war and we're battling, what are we battling with? Are we just trying to get all of the fleshly things we can and work it all out? It'll never happen. It'll never happen for me. It'll never happen for you. We need the spiritual weapons. And then, maybe the most exciting part of this whole message is we have a spiritual captain that goes before us into the battle. <laughs> That's exciting. Just like the devil, well, not exactly like the devil, I guess. He has a hierarchy, and I believe the Lord has a hierarchy. He's got angels that do things for him. and uh, not, not fallen angels, but he has angels that do things for him. And, uh, and he... Uh, 
and he sends them to do them. But he personally goes with us. He personally goes with us. And uh, I want you to go to Joshua chapter 5 with me. This is one of those scriptures that just, they're just wonderful to meditate upon. And in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13. Now I want you to remind you that Joshua here, he didn't understand what we understand today. <laughs> but he got a hold of who the captain was here. But he didn't understand what we understand for sure. Uh, in verse 13 of Joshua chapter 5. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. I mean, we see here the captain of the host of the Lord, or the captain of the Lord's host, either one of those ways you want to say it, is God himself, is Jesus Christ. That's our captain. He's our spiritual captain. In 2 Chronicles, let's go there, verse 13. 2 Chronicles chapter 13 and verse 10. Look what's being said here in, in these few verses. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him, and the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon their business. And they burn unto the Lord every morning and every evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense, the showbread, also set they in order upon the pure table and the candlesticks of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening, for we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but ye have forsaken him. So there's two things going on here. The, per the person speaking here, what's going on is they're saying, we have not forsaken the Lord, but they're talking to someone who has, a group of people who have forsaken the Lord. And this is what he says in verse 12. And behold... God himself is with us for our captain. And his priest with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. O children of Israel. Now they were the ones that were forsaking God. That's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> the ones he loved so much, they forsook him. And he says, O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers. For ye shall not prosper I mean that's just we say that's so simple that's so simple if we don't forsake him we're fighting with him if we forsake him we're fighting against him and we will never win that battle against the Lord and it seems like Israel never learned it but every generation has to learn it for themselves and every generation has to have their own faith in the Lord but what we but what we find here is that we can be fighting alongside of the Lord or we can be found fighting against him. But what the truth is here is that he's the captain of the spiritual battle for right. And we're either going to fight against him or with him. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Beginning in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. When you see that little phrase, made a little lower than angels, he's talking about being made a man. Jesus, who was God, was made a man, a little lower than angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, how many men did he taste death for? Everybody. He paid for everybody's sin on the cross. He tasted death for every man. Verse 10. For it became him, who? Jesus. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, that's talking about Jesus, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's Jesus. The captain of our salvation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fought the greatest war ever waged on earth when he died to defeat sin and the devil on the cross. And then he arose declaring his victory over it. 
I'm thankful for that. Look back at Isaiah with me. Look what he did for us. I love the imagery that Isaiah gives us in Isaiah 53 about ourselves and what he did for us. Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgression, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That is not talking about physically healed. That's talking about spiritual birth, a new life in Christ. Now, he can heal us, but the charismatic group takes this out of context. All we like sheep have gone astray. And you know that's what sheep do, right? Left to themselves, they're all gone astray. And we've all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've all gone astray, but he had all of our iniquity on him. He was op oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And he proved that, right, when he went before Pilate and he went before others, and he said, you're not going to say anything for yourself? And he didn't open his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. I mean, this is what he did for us, for our sins. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a promise. What a promise we have there. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him, talking about God the Father making the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. We need his righteousness. He got the victory for us. Christ is victorious in battle, and he makes us victorious. I want you to go here in closing. I want you to look at this final scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, aren't you glad I'm not one of those preachers that say, go to this and this is final scripture, and then he gives you 10 more scriptures after that? I thought I could get one amen tonight. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. If you don't amen, we'll go to 10 more scriptures. Okay? The Bible says here in verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. He gives us the victory. This is referring to, in context, the final victory. The victory over death, the victory over, uh, over the grave. We have victory. But we must fight the spiritual war with spiritual weapons and follow our spiritual captain, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what verse 58 says. We have the final victory in verse 57. Verse 58 says, Therefore... Therefore, because we already know we have this final victory, the Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is a battle. He said, Don't be moved. He said that we ought to always, uh, always abounding. That's moving forward. Taking more ground. Not just getting defeated, because we have the final victory, we can have this present victory. And we not only can stand in this battle, but we can take ground and take background as we're following the Lord, because we have a spiritual captain who goes before us into battle. He's before us, he's beside us, he's around us, he's above us, he's below us, he's in us. We're protected in Christ. We have victory in him. We are in a spiritual battle that must be fought with spiritual weapons as we follow our spiritual captain. Our warfare. And it's not what you and I can see. It's unseen. Father, take your word tonight. Help us. Help me. Lord, we have such a battle. We don't even know the half of it. Of what's going on right now in the spiritual realm. And I pray you'd help us tonight. I pray you would help us to respond to you the way you have spoken to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open.
You might be here tonight and you somebody say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I don't know if I'm on my way to heaven tonight. I'm pretty sure I'm not on my way to heaven. Let me ask you this, or let me tell you this. There is no battle with you against the world, the flesh, and the devil. There is no battle. Because you're on the devil's side. If you're lost in your sins tonight, you're on the devil's side. You're in bondage to your flesh. And you can't get out of bondage in your flesh. You, you're not battling against the devil. You're battling against the Lord. The Lord is speaking to you of sin and of righteousness and judgment. You have sin. You'll never have his righteousness. You'll never be that righteous. And there's coming a judgment day. What are you going to do about it? He died for you so you could have his righteousness. And at the judgment, you'll stand righteous before the great judge and our great God. You need to be saved. You need to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're doubting that tonight, Jesus Christ can save you and forgive you and make you have peace with him in your life. Believers, do you realize that you're even in a battle? Do you realize there's a battle even going on around you? Are you taking your armor daily? Do you, are you remembering this daily? Are you asking God to help you daily, moment by moment, through your life? Are you following the Lord and renewing your mind? Is there ground that needs to be gained tonight? Tell the Lord that. Lord, there's some ground. I know I need to gain this ground in my life, and I need your help. Is there ground that needs to be taken back that you've lost? Why don't you tell the Lord? Father, I've, I, I used to have this ground in my life, and it was secured, and I was standing, and I was battling, but I lost the ground. I lost it. But I want you to help me get it back. I need victory in this area in my life tonight. Would you tell the Lord that? Would you be honest with the Lord? He knows your heart. He knows the battle. He knows what the world's enticing you to do. He knows what your flesh is wanting to do. The devil's laughing because he's got this system that's very conniving, very deceitful. Very subtle. And he knows what he's put in motion to get us. But the Lord can give us victory. Father, thank you for whatever you revealed to us tonight and helped us with. I pray that we'd leave this at your feet. We'd yoke up with you. We'd find victory in you. We'd learn of you like you asked us to. And we'd go out and battle. We'd battle when we leave here. We'd battle for you and with you uh, tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And uh, where we'd just come back together and be encouraged again soon. And then we'd just go out and do battle again. Well, really, we're doing battle right now. The devil doesn't want us to be here together. So he'll keep many people away so they can't battle. They're not winning that area in their life. And so, Lord, please help us. Help us to win the battle. Help us to walk with you. Help us to glorify you. Now, until you come back, we're looking for your coming, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.